and amen. Again this morning, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew 6, 33. Says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be given to you. Father, again, we thank you for the reading of your word. And I pray, Lord God, that it would go forth and touch many, many hearts and lives. And I thank you for the touch upon my own heart, Lord. Anoint me to be able to speak as you have given this to me to speak. And anoint the ears and the hearts of the people that receive it. And let it accomplish much in your name. Amen. And amen. Several years ago, I was stationed in Germany as a battalion, at a battalion headquarters. And during a part of that time, I was the company first sergeant. We had people who would come into the battalion and stay there for a few days while they were processed and assigned to their permanent companies. One day, a new arrival came into the orderly room and demanded to see me. Now, usually, senior NCOs don't take well to demands. But I said, sure, I'll take some time and see him. He came into my office and he said, First Sergeant, this is a mistake. I should not be here in Germany. I'm a Christian. And I'm supposed to be at my church in Denver, not here. I asked him why, and his reply was interesting. He said, God's not here in Germany. He's only in my church in Denver. Well, I, I told the young man that I was a Christian as well, and that I simply thought he was wrong. God was in Germany just as much as he was in Denver. I also told him that God had an assignment for him here in Germany. Now, the Department of the Army may have signed your orders, but God is the one who sends people where he wants them to be. I told him that I would pray with him and see if God would reveal it to him. And so we did. We prayed. He thanked me and he left my office, but I could tell that he was not very convinced that I knew what I was talking about. Later that afternoon, I received a call from the battalion command sergeant major. And he asked me if I would take a few minutes and come up to his office. I arrived at the command sergeant major's office and reported. He looked at me and said, do you know Specialist Smith? And I told him, I do not know him. I do not recall that name. He said, you know, the guy that you talked to this morning and told him that God was here in Germany and, as well as in Denver. And I thought, boy, the word gets around pretty fast, doesn't it? I said, yes. Now that you mention it, I remember him. Now, catch, catch this picture. The command sergeant major looked at me straight in the eye and said, Would you tell me about Jesus? Now, although it was intimidating talking to this worn, torn, and he did. He looked worn and torn. This army vet who had served many years had been to combat. I took a deep breath, looked him square in the eye, and I told him about my Jesus and what Jesus had done for me. He looked at me and said, First Sergeant, I've spent time in Vietnam, so I've been to hell. He said, I believe because of my service, I will be rewarded with heaven. I swallowed, and as gently as I could, I told him, Sergeant Major, that won't work. You need Jesus, and you need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. This old worn face, this torn face, this face that had been through many, many years of trial and struggle, Tears began to go down his face as he looked at me and shook his head no and told me I could go. You know, Jesus didn't say that we would always find success in the things that we do, but we are commanded to share the gospel with everyone we see. I want to ask a question of Angle Lake Neighborhood Church this morning. Who are you? What, the, what answer you give will tell a lot about who you really are. And possibly the greatest challenge... And the greatest tragedy of today's church or today's followers of Jesus is that many of them do not know who they are. Here's the problem. You may be a believer, but your faith is just another part of who you are. Are you com comprehending what I'm saying? You just add Jesus on to the rest of you. 
You add him on to your life. My friends, I have to tell you something this morning. You can't just add Jesus to your life. Jesus has to be everything. Or really, he's nothing at all. If we proclaim to be Christians, then we are members of the kingdom of God. And our identity is reflected in what is most important to you. Now get that, please. Being a Christian is not just a title, but our identification. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is really the essence of who we are. That is why we must all be kingdom disciples. My sermon title this morning is Kingdom Disciples. Constantly learning, constantly growing in Christ's likeness, following Jesus' words, and growing spiritually. So I'm going to take a few minutes and look at these areas of discipleship. Are you a kingdom disciple? That's the question that I want every person to keep in mind. Or am I a kingdom disciple this morning? So let's look at discipleship. The first area that I want to look at is the domain. If you're keeping notes, the domain. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Let me say that again. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred, somebody shout glory, and transferred us into the kingdom of his, dear friend, of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. If you call yourself a Christ follower, if you call yourself a Christian, then God has transferred you from an old domain to a new one, a new dominion, so to speak. You've been placed into a new environment, the kingdom of God's beloved Son. We cannot be disciples until we first enter into His realm. Theologian Dallas Willard, who has gone on to receive his reward, stated one time, and I found this so fascinating. Theologian Dallas Willard said this, It is almost universally conceded today that you can be a Christian without being a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's stunning. Those are stunning words. He also goes on to say this. Non-discipleship is the elephant in the room. It is not the much discussed moral failures, financial abuses, or the amazing general similarities between Christians and non-Christians. These are only the effects of the underlying problem. The fundamental, fundamental negative reality among Christian believers now is their failure, failure to be constantly learning how to live their lives in the kingdom among us. And it is a, an accepted reality. I'm shocked by those words. Utterly shocked. That in many places the accepted reality is, is you can be a Christ follower and not be a disciple. My friends, 2021 is going to be a challenging year for all of us. And this is very, spe very specifically for the church. And as we enter into 2021, we cannot afford to miss the discipleship that will help us to grow and then to be able to stand up against the darkness. Do not be distracted today by the world's promises. And in the process, miss what God has intended for you. Do not be distracted by the world's promises. A few years ago, Han and I went, were in Orlando, Florida. And while we were there, we saw an advertisement for Gatorland. We decided we would go. Never been to Gatorland. Thought we'd go check it out. The first thing that caught my attention was the big sign out front that said how much it costs to get into Gatorland. Wow! I couldn't believe how expensive it was. Thank goodness they had a little highlight on the bottom that said, Military gets in free. Well, after we'd been there for a while, free might have been too much. 
you know, it was all right. There was a place where you could put a little fish on a line, a hook, and dip it into the water, and little alligators would jump up and grab the fish and snatch it off your, off your line. They had a little museum where you could look at all the reptiles that they had. There was a nature walk that would take you a whole mile and a half into the Florida Everglades. But the main show was the one everyone wanted to see. And there was a couple of guys named Bubba and Zeke who would hold whole chickens over the rail on the line. And then very large alligators would jump up and grab the chicken and pull it down. I was not overly impressed. The world is a lot like that, my friends. It promises you a great show. But once you experience it, you realize it's just false advertisement. Who knows what I'm talking about? And 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This, these are powerful scriptures. Listen. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. There is one thing that I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt this morning, and it is this. The world cannot give you life, purpose, or direction. For that, we need the power of the Holy Ghost, my friends, as He gives us those things as we submit to Him. Following after Jesus and His kingdom not only will bring you into a new domain, it will bring you into a new program. And if you're taking notes, my second point is of discipline. Of discipline. 1 Timothy 4, 7. But refuse profane and foolish myths. Instead, exercise in the ways of godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable in all things. Holding promise for the present life. And also for the life to come. Anything, anything that we do for the kingdom of God takes discipline. Can I say that again? Anything that we do for the kingdom of God takes discipline. I, I won't speak for anyone else in this house, but in the past I have struggled with staying in shape. I have to get off the couch every once in a while and do some exercise. And I have to tell myself to do it. Being in shape does not happen on its own. I can't just sit on my couch and say, I'm going to get in shape. It doesn't work. In fact, you'll just get in worse shape as the day goes by. But I'm telling you, being in shape does not happen on its own. There needs to be a little sweat and a little pain. There's a part of me every time that says, every time. Every time that I get dressed to go exercise, there's a part of me that says, ah, let's skip it today. There will always be tomorrow. Who here knows that tomorrow never comes? Never comes. Now, Paul told Timothy, if a little exercise makes a body better, then we must use that same logic when it comes to our spiritual well-being. It takes discipline. To get up early to pray. To read God's word daily. And have, a, and have a time of reading where it really means something. Not just to check the list. But to read God's word and say to the Holy Spirit, Lord, help me understand what it is that I'm reading today. Open my heart to your truths and to your precepts. Help me see what it is that you're talking to me about today. It takes discipline to read God's word that way. To meditate on the presence of the Holy Spirit. Every day we should be in the presence of God. We should invite his Holy Spirit to come and be a part of everything that we're doing. Not just in words, but in actions. To challenge ourselves to walk in holiness. To get up in the morning and say, today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I will walk in holiness. And when temptation comes, and it will, 
We are to reject it and walk in the presence of God. When it comes to spiritual exercise, God has provided His wonderful grace to help us with discipline. Titus 2.11 For the grace of God, please read these words carefully, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And this grace teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly, righteously, and in godliness in this present world as we await the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I need grace. Anybody else in the house need grace? I need more grace and more grace and more grace and more grace. Because it gives me the power and the ability to be the man that God has called me to be. Helps me to overcome. Anybody here today need to overcome? I want to be an overcomer. And listen, I, 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 it's not in my message to necessarily today. But we are closer to the rapture today than we ever have been. Let our hearts be prepared. Let our minds be ready to see the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word can't, and I know that's a conjunction for two words. I can't is never an excuse for the Christ follower. Everybody say this with me. Yes, I can. Say it again. Yes, I can. One more time. Yes, I can. By the grace of God. Who hears what I'm saying this morning? Get that can't out of your vocabulary. And start walking in what God has given each and every one of us. Because I walk in the power and the strength of my Lord Jesus Christ, not in myself. Keep this in mind. Discipline. It's not about just going through the motions. I'm convinced that there are many just going through the motions. Many that are just serving God out of habit or serving God out of some kind of duty. Where's the passion this morning? Where's the passion that says I serve a risen Savior? And because of what He's accomplished in my life, I will serve Him with a passion. That goes beyond what the world can even begin to understand or know. I love Jesus. And I know that he loves me. And because of that, I want to pursue him. I want to pursue Jesus. With a passion that says to how much I love him. And to tell him how much I love him. And the grace that will give me the power to be disciplined. I don't want anybody to raise a hand. But I just want to ask this question. Is there anyone here that needs discipline in your life? Let me raise my hand first. No hands. I'm just saying, ask yourself the question. Am I disciplined? Following after Jesus and his kingdom will not only bring you into a new domain and bring you into a new program of discipline. We must also meet, third point, the demands. The demands. Revelation 2.4. But I have something against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. A farmer once put an ad in a local newspaper. Farmer with 160 irrigated acres wants to marry a beautiful woman with a tractor. Gets better. When applying, please show a picture of the tractor. Sounds disgusting, doesn't it? This farmer is not looking for a wife to love, but a wife to, to abuse or to use. Now, before we judge this man too harshly, I want to ask every person here, would you look in the mirror and look at your own heart and ask yourself the hard question, why do I serve Jesus? Is Jesus first in your lives? Seriously. Or is he second, third, or maybe on down the list? Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in all things he may have preeminence. Oh, listen this morning to me as I tell you, Angle Lake Neighborhood Church, we must desire an intimate relationship with Jesus and be sincere about it. 
a serious demand to put Jesus first in everything that we do. What are you willing to give up to have this intimacy with Jesus? And before you get nervous, before you start saying, I can't give these things up or I can't give that up or I can't surrender that, listen to me very carefully. I have found in God's economy that when I give up something that God wants me to give up, He gives me 10 other things that are better than what I had to begin with. Don't get nervous. Just listen to the heart of God and understand and know this, that I don't serve him for what he can give to me. I serve him for what he's done for me. He gave himself for me so that I can have life. We sang that this morning, did we not? I'm alive today because of what Christ has accomplished in my life. What are you willing to give up? To have this intimacy with Jesus. A little boy once got his hand caught in a vase. His parents tried everything to get his hand out. But nothing worked. They told the boy that he needed to brace himself. Because they were going to have to get a hammer. And break that vase to get him free. The boy looked up at his mother and said. Mommy would it help if I let go of the penny I'm holding? The answer to that is what? Yes! I am amazed at how often the thing that captures us and holds us are the things that we flat refuse to let go of. And because we won't let go of it, we are captured. Satan has us. And Jesus tells us day in and day out that he has given us everything we need to be set free. I ask you today, what are you holding on to? What is it that you're grasping on to that keeps you from serving God the way that you desire and even the way that he wants you to? I tell you, today is today. Somebody say, today is today. To let go of the penny so that you get your hand out of the jar. It's okay. Listen to me carefully. It's okay. To have things. It's okay to pursue hobbies. But if these things possess you. Then my friends you have a problem. You simply have a problem. I believe that there are some here today. That you've allowed things. People. Ideals. Emotions. To possess you. And it is time to let go. And let God set you free. I just feel empowered by the Holy Spirit. Maybe every eye closed just for a minute. If you feel like that you have something that you've put before God today, would you just raise a hand towards the sky, no one looking, and just ask God to set you free. Father, I pray, set free the captives. Set free the captives. God, help us, I pray right now, to let go of the things that hinder and hold us back. And I give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted. Look up at pastor here. Following after Jesus and his kingdom not only brings you into a new domain, brings you into a new program of discipline, requires that we must meet demands. You must also count the cost. Count the cost. Luke 14, 31. Or what king going to wage war against another king does not sit first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Otherwise, while the other is yet at a distance, he sends a delegation and requests conditions of peace. So likewise, any of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciples. What hard words these are of Jesus. Probably some of the hardest words that he spoke on this earth. A troubled and burdened man prayed and prayed that God would lift his burdens. Day after day he prayed that his life would be easier. He begged God for intervention. One day Jesus shows up and presents himself to the man. And he asked the man, what is it that troubles you? And the man replied that his life was so full of turmoil that it had become too much to bear. He again asked for help, stating that he just couldn't continue to go on. 
Jesus took the man by the hand and led him to a large room. He stopped at the front door of this room and he opened it. And what the man saw was amazing. The room was filled with crosses, little crosses, big crosses, giant crosses. The man, bewildered, looked at Jesus and asked, how is this going to help? And Jesus explained that each cross represented a burden that people carry. Small burdens, big burdens, giant burdens, every burden in between. Jesus said, now take your cross and throw it into the room. And the man did. Jesus closed the door and walked around to the other side. And he opened up the door. And he told the man, go into the room and find the cross that you think you can carry. The man saw a little tiny cross way back in the corner. It was the smallest cross in the room. After a bit of thought, he pointed to the cross and he said, this one, Lord, I believe I can carry this one. And Jesus said, are you sure? The man replied quickly, oh, yes, Lord, most definitely, yes. With a smile on his face, Jesus looked at the man and said, my friend, that's the cross that you just threw into the room. We sometimes think that our load is too heavy. But I want every person here to know that there are great, great loads, giant loads that people carry. Ask God to give you the endurance to carry on, to be the person that he wants you to be. I want us to each one of us to weigh these words with a genuine heart. Kingdom discipleship, my friends, will cost you everything. Everything. Listen, in all seriousness, I believe that the church of the Most High God in America is getting ready to be attacked like it never has been before. We will be challenged to stand for righteousness. And in the process, we will either be called criminal or we will compromise and surrender to the world. Jesus knew what laid ahead for his followers. My friends, we must recognize that and understand that hardships are coming. We, we cannot live in this world and believe that somehow hardships are not coming our way. I so As much as I appreciated the tongues and interpretation this morning, I so appreciated the tongues and interpretation last Sunday as God encouraged us to be ready for those times. To be ready. Do you remember? He talked about taking us through the fire that would bring us to maturity. If the church of Jesus Christ is going to make it in 2021, and I believe that it will without a doubt, then the people need to be matured through the fire of the Holy Spirit. Because there are struggles that are coming. And he also said it's not just about going through the fire to be matured. But God is also making us salt so that we can go into this world and tell the world about Jesus Christ because that is what they so desperately need. I want to ask you this question. How many of you know that in the darkest time, it's not a question, I'll make a statement. How many of you know that in the darkest times, the light of Jesus shines the brightest? The light of Jesus shines the brightest in the darkest times. It is too easy, listen to me, too easy to get upset, to get frustrated, let anger overcome us, and think, oh, woe is me. You may say, Pastor, how do you know I'm going through that? Because I just went through that this week. And I figure you're all just like I am. It's okay, I love hearing babies cry in church. It's a good thing. Little Emma wants to get in some time, doesn't she? It's too easy for those things to distract us from what God is doing. Listen, who here knows someone who desperately needs Jesus? Let me see a hand. You know someone who desperately needs Jesus in their life. Almost every hand. Almost every hand. My hand twice. Let us be that example for them to see that through the darkness, Jesus' light will shine the brightest. And when they come to you, and they will, they will come to you and say, 
How is it that you have joy in your heart when life seems to be so difficult? And you can say, because I know the author of my joy, and it's Jesus Christ. Who here is ready to lead someone to Jesus? i got a couple of hands. <laughs> a couple of hands. My friends, be ready. Because you are getting ready to be faced with a world that desperately needs Jesus. And a church that needs to rise above the frail. And understand and know who we are. A deacon once came to visit John Wesley at his home. And the deacon bragged on about how much he had suffered. And was willing to suffer for the Lord. Then a puff of smoke from the fireplace blew into his face. And the deacon said to Wesley, see how much I suffer for Christ? Wesley replied, Man, if you can't take a little smoke coming into your life, you'll never stand the fire. You'll never stand the fire. The worship team would come, but I'd like for them to be still. They can come, but be still. I want to tell you about a man that Han and I met many, many years ago. And it touched my life, and I know hers tremendously. Many years ago, we were attending a church, and the church invited an evangelist to come and preach a series of services. The evangelist's name was Ira Stanfield. Now, for the older folks in the house, you know exactly who Ira Stanfield is. Let me tell you his story. Ira Stanfield was an Assemblies of God evangelist when he was in his early 20s. He went around the country preaching. He had a, the, the, the uh, hand accordion that he would play. That was pretty popular back in the day, but he would play the accordion. He was at one church, and the pastor's daughter was just stunningly beautiful. He said, I got to get to know this young lady a little more. She could sing. Her voice was beautiful. Iris spent more time there, I think, probably than any other church he'd ever been to. And he eventually courted the young woman, and they married and they together went across the nation then, evangelizing. She would sing, he would play, she would sing, and then he would preach the gospel. Several years went by and he could tell that she was starting to get really dissatisfied with the things that were going on. But he said, I'll just trust God to take care of things. One day he was coming home and he passed her walking down the street holding hands with another man. He got home that night and confronted her, and she said, I'm leaving you. I'm going to New York City and pursue music as a career. They had a son named Jay, and she left Jay, and she left Ira Stanfield, and she went off to New York to pursue her career in music with this man that she had met. A few years later, she applied for divorce and was granted divorce. Ira Stanfield, as an Assemblies of God minister, knew that he could never remarry, not as long as she was alive, because if, she, if he did, he would lose his credentials. So he just, with his son, went from several churches, being an associate pastor, a music pastor. And a few years after she went to New York, she was killed in a car accident. And Ira then was able to remarry and had other children. And the reason why I tell you that story is because Ira Stanfield is very possibly one of our greatest hymn writers. See if you recognize a few of these songs. He washed my eyes with tears. My brothers and I used to sing that song. Who's ever heard that song, He Washed My Eyes With Tears? Most of the older folks. I would break out in song, but I can't remember all the words to it. I don't, he says, I know who holds tomorrow. There's another song that he wrote. Mansion over the hilltop. Ira Stanfield wrote that song. Room at the cross. Supper time. My father's favorite song. Supper time. 30 pieces of silver. Ira wrote that song as well. Unworthy, he wrote. I share these songs with you because Ira wrote all these songs when he was going through the trial and the burden and the suffering 
of being without his wife and having to raise a son alone and going from church to church and trying to minister and people looking at him as if he was broken. Iris Stanfield had done nothing wrong. He was just trying to serve God. I think possibly my favorite song that I ever wrote was this one called Follow Me. I'm going to try to sing it, so hold on to your hats for a few minutes because I might break down and start crying. And if I do, I'll just stop singing and I'll just read it to you. And I hope Frank's got it so he can put it up on the board. Follow me. I traveled down a lonely road and no one seemed to care. The burden on my weary back had bowled me to despair. I oft complained to Jesus how folks were treating me. And then I heard him say so tenderly. My feet were all so weary upon the Calvary's road. The cross became so heavy, I fell beneath the load. Be faithful, weary pilgrim, the morning I can see. Just lift your cross and follow close to me. I work so hard for Jesus, I often boast and say, I've sacrificed a lot of things to walk the narrow way. I gave up fame and fortune, I'm worth a lot to thee. And then I hear him gently say to me, I left the throne of glory and counted it but loss. My hands were nailed in anger upon a cruel, cruel cross. But now we'll make the journey with your hand safe in mine. So lift your cross and follow close to me. Oh, Jesus, if I die upon a foreign field someday, I would be no more than love demands, no less could I repay. No greater love hath mortal man than for a friend to die. These are the words he gently spoke to me. If just a cup of water I place within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. But if by death to living they can thy glory see, I'll take my cross and follow close to thee. I want to ask every person here, if you will make a commitment to be a kingdom disciple of Jesus Christ, would you please stand to your feet? I make a commitment to be a kingdom disciple don't just stand because I've asked you to stand, but stand with a commitment that says, I will be the kingdom disciple that Jesus wants me to be.